gifts that they have. Amen. Maybe one person may not have the notes, but I can, okay. One person. But I am excited just to see what God um, is doing um, in all of our lives. Amen. So we're going to, without further ado, we are going to get started. And Bible study has officially started. Um, praise the Lord. Amen. All right. So we are all not green. And so I'm asking everybody to participate in this section. <laughs> Amen. Um, so familiar with chapter 31. I, I know you probably didn't read Sister Alicia Ezekiel. Oh, that's right. Amen. All right. So let's see here. Who wants to go first? No, they got a volunteer. Do you want to go first? You want to get out the way, Erica? Everybody has to go. Bible study has changed. Um, Okay. Girl, get out of here. That's what I'm talking about. Mm. Another towel at you. Amen. That was very good. That was very good. Brought tears to my eyes. That was very good. I like that. Anybody else? Oh, it's not time to put the finger up and leave the church. Now. <laughs> Oh, she said, uh, is that no, no leaving the building? I'm dropping my tea bag. All right, go ahead, Sister Naisha. It's the, everybody always takes what you got to say. Come on now, get get your facts straight. Get your facts straight. You 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 on the right track. I'm just I'm just I'm just messing. I'm just teasing. Well, not exactly the same thing, because he didn't go eat in the field now. Right. Yeah. Or we can just, that can be synonymous with the pit of hell, hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So it was like the, it was basically the underworld. All right. And I'm going to hit you back up in a, a little bit, Sister Naisha. Come on, sis. Come on down. Ah, oh, whatever. <laughs> yes, he is. Right, right. You, you, you pull some, you pull some good ones. Uh huh. Not everybody. So let's just let's just say the majority. That's the ma right. That's the majority, sis. Go ahead. Right. Girl, you all up in my message. Not for the here, but girl, you in my message. I I totally could not agree with all you guys more. Um, that chaos is running this course. And when you talk about, I hinted on it on Sunday about, um, you know, President-elect Trump wanting to move the temple from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which is falling right in line with the prophecy of now, if, if it moves or when it moves, you know, Jerusalem already, some of them already got the plans ready to build this new temple for an antichrist or the antichrist to come sit on that throne and rule. So the mere fact that he's saying he wants to move this temple when the United States would not even move this temple at all, it's dangerous. Because it's not it's dangerous to the unsaved, but to the saved, we know that God is this much more closer, excuse me, to coming. And one of the things Sister Naisha hit on, um, everybody hit on pride. And we're going to talk about pride in a little bit. But she hit on Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is interesting. I had it. It's in Daniel chapter 4. Um, I was listening, and I was like, man, that is good. I heard somebody talking about it, and I was like, man, that's good. I just didn't have enough time to put it in my slide. But Daniel chapter 4 talks about the fall of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm being puffed up in pride, and it's really his a testament. He is writing. Daniel didn't write this. He wrote this because he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, he was, he was low. He ate with the dogs, <laughs> with the fields. I mean, he was just retarded for seven years, and then re got restored back into his kingship. And then he understood who God was, or is. And that's just something that we just have to understand. Everything that's coming in place is to show us who God is. 
you know, and I've been pondering on all you guys' messages and been just in my head. And I mean, it's, 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 it's spot on. And like you said, I had no idea Ezekiel was this deep, right? I've read through Ezekiel, but I've never done a super, super in-depth study. And so I'm like, <laughs> my eyes are open. My eyes are open. Matter of fact, um, talked to a good friend, good pastor friend of mine, and I told him, I said, man, I can't wear them clergy collars no more because I know where they come from. They come, the, the little clergy collars you see the Catholic wearing, the little white yoke things, those really represent some pagan stuff that we wear. And and even he knew what I was talking about. He was like, yeah, that's Papos. You know, that's a paganism. Yeah. And it used to be only uh, Catholic folk would wear those. But, you know, it's crept into the church. And now everybody wants to wear these collars to be um, be connected. Everybody wants to wear these collars to be connected. and But it really represents false god. Paganism. Go ahead, Erica. I'm just happy. And the trees in there, Garden of Eden, yeah. They couldn't walk around. They couldn't walk through history now. So I think when you think about it, that's the only reason that is what's happening. Like, nobody could walk around. He was just there. So that's a good point. And so it just shows, it really, it really shows how. It really shows how the tree, as they're saying, the cedar rose to an, to a height where even the garden. <clears throat> <clears throat> yes. So. <clears throat> so going into the intro. Yeah. So going into the intro of the text. The intro is going to talk about a fallen cedar, which we all have established, right? And so in this time, the Lord challenges Pharaoh and his army to learn a lesson from a hist historical standpoint. Uh, Assyria, uh, I mean Assyria, Assyria, it's Assyria is the one that's being used in this, in this theme. And we can tell that the empire is from 745 to 622. Um, it had once been like a mighty cedar of Lebanon. It was well nour nourished and grew tall, like everybody's saying. Birds lodged in its branches, and animals sought, uh, sought shelter under its shade. Not even the trees of the Garden of Eden, which Sister Erica just said, could rival in the majesty and beauty of it. And we're going to talk about that in a second. However, because of its pride, like we just talked about, God delivered it over to a ruthless nation, the Babylonians, which we understand Nebuchadnezzar, who chopped it down. And it says no other tree would ever grow so tall. So Pharaoh also was like a great tree, but like Assyria, he and his army would come crashing to the earth. Now, to understand this text, the sex opening date notice fixed the oracle. An oracle is so this oracle or allegory. You may read that in story or oracle. The same thing. It's prof prophetic prophecy. Um, on the first day of the third month in eleventh year, this is verse one. Jehoiakim's exile. That is June first, five eighty seven B C. And this is two months after the previous oracle or writing of. Um, Ezekiel 30 verse 20. So what we see here is that two months after Ezekiel chapter 30, uh, Ezekiel gets another prophetic word. And this prophetic word is dated and is, and is breaking down even more about um, um, Egypt. Here's something to, to notice before we go any further. Sometimes God will just give you a piece of the puzzle and have you write it down, and then later on, he might 
more nuggets into you to really expound on what he set up. Now, you and I reading this from the standpoint, we're like, well, man, just chapter after chapter, we're thinking sometimes that this is just one stretched out book. But we have to understand that these books or these chapters were written over a period of time. Meaning Ezekiel could have wrote this and God could have given him another, other revelations to think about that. Maybe he didn't write or maybe he did write. We don't know yet. Um, but then he said, this one you need to write down and record to give to the people. So it's very important that we understand that the chapters that we read are not, you know, and I woke up the next day and wrote it. Sometimes these are months apart, years apart, weeks apart. In this case, it's about eight Eight, eight to nine weeks, two months, depending on the, the countering cycle. But in other words, it's a couple of months apart. So we talked about themes. One of the themes that we're going to talk about right now is beauty. Now, we notice in the beginning, right, the text told us that they were, they had, right? We all can agree that that was in the text that we read. Yes? No? All right. So a beauty, beauty is, or the synopsis of it, is a physical or spiritual quality which brings pleasure to those who behold it. Scripture stresses that, stresses the beauty of God himself and his creation, while nothing that the beauty of the creation can lead away from God or become uh, isol idol idolized. But one of the scriptures, well, not a but, but one of the scriptures that came to mind that I did not put in here, was in Romans, where they worship the creation rather than the creator. In other words, they worship the beauty of what the creator actually created instead of worshiping the creator who created the creations and, you know, the heavens and the earth. And this is where we find out where uh, in, this, in this text um, Assyria is. What else is Assyria? What other name is Assyria likened to in the Bible? See, that's why you got to bring your notes with you. You never know. Just can't read it now. It, it, it goes back into, I'll give you a hint, it's in Genesis. Uh-huh. Okay. It starts with an A. No, I just said A. She said, you said Asia. She said uh, Abraham, uh, uh, Abram, and April. She, April, uh, Adam. What is Assyria, other's name? Asher. If you if you read the commentaries, if you read the commentaries, I know you did, but you had a good you had some good points. So I'm not I'm not knocking on you. I'm not knocking on you. You had some good nuggets. Asher. You'll see Asher in the Bible along with Assyria. And in some translations, they may say Asher and not Assyria. All right. So, about beauty. So we have beauty in nature. Ecclesiastics, I don't know why I put that in there twice, um, but make mistakes. Must have been when you were calling. Exactly. So Ecclesiastics, it must be very important. So Ecclesiastics 3.11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. We're talking about beauty in nature here. Now, also with beauty, beauty may lead to pride and lust. So we find out in the text in Proverbs 6, 25 through 26, it says, do not desire her beauty in your heart. And do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread. But a married woman hurts, hunts down a precious life. 
can lead pride. It can lead to lust. Kill 28.17 says, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You, you corrupted your wit for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I expose you before kings to feast their eyes on you. Now, who is he talking about in Ezekiel chapter 28? Those that have been here? No, and try it again. Nope. No, I, how how soon we forget? No, we have not. Who do we just get finished talking about before we hit? No, now y'all just fishing. And y'all fishing in the wrong pool, Lebanon. Lebanon's in this text. Y'all fishing in the wrong pool. I see, I'm going to have to do a pop quiz. Y'all killing me. We had to do a quiz. Huh? No, I'm not. No, see, they, they should know because we, we hammered these texts. Okay. Ezekiel 28. Who is he talking about? I'm not telling them the letter. Are you sure? I'll give you a hint. It's not Israel. It's not Israel. Has nothing to do with Israel, Jerusalem? Huh? But what are the other people? Nah, you ain't get away with that, Jack. So, a hint, from chapter 1 to chapter 24, he dealt solely with the children of Israel. Who, who's the leader? No. The same thing. Is, he says, your heart. He doesn't say yours. Singular. One person he's talking about. I, I know you wouldn't know, uh, Sister. He was at school. Sister is the agent that God is using to kill who? Besides Israel. She just said, Sidon, no. She's in the Ryan. She's in the round area. She's close. Who priest? What you mean? Come on. This is a very no. Cause in the no, this is a very important chapter. Okay, hint is by Sidon. Sidon, S-I-D-O-N. Tyre. Tyre is a city, is in chapter 25, is in chapter T, is T-Y-R-E. Now, now that we have tire, okay, okay, now come on, now we ain't sidebarring. Now, because tire is the agent, but in this chapter, who is he talking about? With in verse seventeen, no, she said tire. But if you remember the text switch, do you need to pull out chapter twenty-eight? It is not Israel. No. She pull your Bible. Pull your get your Bible. Get get your mother's Bible over there, please, Sister Erica. It's, okay. Chapter 28. Lord, we trying to get past this. 
You can't Google this because you're not gonna know the agent. Oh, I just said ten times. Jerusalem is not the answer. Eh, wrong again. No, read the text. The, not Tyree, the king of Tyre, but in the text, read the text. Say Israel again. Somebody say Israel. Let me see your. I said, I said the text changed. Didn't I say the text changed? Wrong. There's something else in the middle of this text. Okay, let's see here. Let's 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 bring this home so I can ease your mind. No. Okay, verse 13. What does 13 say? Besides uh-huh. So who is he talking about? Thou thou has been in the garden of Eden of God. Topaz is not. <laughs> Uh huh. I can't hear you. What you? Where? Where were they preparing in? It says. Oh, which verse is that? Okay. So stop. If it is the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre was not an anointed cherub, was he? So then who is was Jacob an angel, dear? <laughs> who is the anointed cherub that he is talking about? Thank you. What do you mean it's not in there? Why would it read the text? It says, thou art, okay, from the English standard verse, it says, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I And women, women, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou has walked up and down in the midst of the stones of the fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. No. Yeah. No. As as. No. So. So now, who are we talking about now in this? Satan. Satan. Satan is the corporate in here. Yes, they talk about the king of Tyre. And 28, and Sister Alicia, in the, if you read chapter 28, the beginning verse, it will talk about the king of Tyre, T-Y-R-E. Right, so it talks about Tyre, but it switches, and it points the, the finger now, or the, the, the gun, at Satan. And like First Lady said, you, your beauty. We're talking about beauty. So Satan, what, what, what was Satan caught up on? And okay, yeah, well, 
Okay, so let's now start linking this to the text. If the king of Tyre is being mimicked after him, and then the king of um, Asher or Syria is doing the same thing, he is acting like who? Thank you. He is acting like Satan because he's caught on his beauty, his splendor. Yes. Thank you. But we we already we right. But we break we broke down beauty, a physical spiritual quality which brings pleasure to those who behold it. So he's he's on him, he's on himself, right? Okay, and so what did God do? He exposed Satan here, and what is he doing in the text? Who? Exactly, Pharaoh. But he's using who as an example in the text? No, in, okay, in chapter 31, who is he using as an example? In 31, who's the tree represent? Who's the tree represent? Thank you, Assyria. Uh, or Asher. Thank you. Sure, unsure. So, this is something to understand. This is likened to pride, but it tells you that if you are caught on yourself, this is going to be your downfall. He's going to expose you first. <laughs> He going to rip you up. He going to expose you. He going to tear you down. The beauty of God as the joy of believers. We're going to get back to the beauty. We'll talk about it in pride. One of the things, one thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and acquire his tip. There's a song, Marvin said, Marvin said, you know, son, one thing that I desire, right? Okay, scripture. Envy. Uh-huh. So envy is a desire for a, another gifts, possessions, positions, achievements, closely associated with jealousy. It don't have to be you. But there are people... But there are people who have, who, well, let's put it this way. Sometimes, sometimes folk may say, I wish you were like them. Huh? Huh? A desire for another gift. I wish you could sing like that. I wish I could sing like this. Uh, yeah, I wish our organist could play like that. Envy. Look. Or I want to be like so-and-so because so-and-so got it going on. If I, if I, like, I, like she, she said, if I had that, or if I had that money, but I'm just saying, I achievements. Amen. Achievements. If I had smarts, if I had your brain, can I just borrow your brain for 30 minutes? All right. Envy is the result of human sin. Proverbs 23, 17. Is, Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue to fear, continue in the fear of the Lord all day. Matthew 15, 19 through 20 says, For out of the heart comes what? Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immortality, thief, witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with an unwashed hands does not defile anyone. He's telling you, evil comes out of the heart. And these are just a little bit of, of things that can defile a person. It results from envy. First, it starts with beauty. Look at me. Look at what I got. Then you, you tap into being envious. 
Remember, we talked about it on Sunday. Did the angels have a choice to choose who they were going to worship? Why? Say it again. Yes. Yes. So that is true. A third of the stars of heaven decision to follow Satan. The Bible says Satan had lawlessness in him, right? So a third of heaven chose to follow the light of Satan. So they saw his splendor and his beauty, and they chose to follow that splendor and beauty. All right? So, you know, we, we, we talked about it on Sunday. You know, some of us maybe maybe never realized that they had they had a choice. But in all actuality, they did have a they did have a choice. So the scripture says, envy arise from the good fortune of others. That's what's that's what we're gonna talk about. Genesis 26, 12 through 14. And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. And then, and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants. So the Philistines envied him. The Philistines envied him. All right. The results of envy. Surely vexation kills the fool. And jealousy slays the simple. Results of enviness. You can get vexed. Your spirit being vexed. I remember, I'm not going to say where my wife was, but she told me she was at some place and she, she said, my spirit got vexed. I ain't going back there again, right? Um, but, I, you know, she's experiencing it. I got to say, I've experienced it. Never thought I would experience being vexed, but being in a vex, your spirit being vexed, it's not a good state to be in. You feel ugly. You feel weird. It just ain't right. But it says vexation will kill the fool. I got to say, I was a fool. <laughs> I was a big dummy. I was a fool. And jealousy will slay the simple. So I said, when you get jealous, you simple. Crazy. Crazy. Proverbs 14.30 says, what is that? Oh, oh, a tranquil heart gives life to the fresh, but envy makes the bones rot. Look at that. But envy makes the bones rot, which means there's no life going to those bones because they're envy of somebody else or trying to be like somebody. Uh-huh. Ecclesiastes 4 and 4 says, Then I saw that a toe and all skin in work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a stri and a starving after win. Striving, that's what I thought it was. Striving after win. Envy is forbidden. Psalms 37 1 says, Fret not yourself because of evildoers, be not envious of wrongdoers. Proverbs 3 31 says, Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. It's all text. It's all text. Oh, yeah. Now we at it now. Pride. We just hit beauty, envy, and pride. Pride refers to an unwarranted attitude of confidence. While pride can have a positive connotation of self-worth or boasting, it is often used in scripture to refer refer to a unhealthy 
elevated view of oneself, abilities, or possessions. Man, that's crazy. An uh, unhealthy, elevated view of oneself, abilities, or possession. Come on now. Isn't that what Lucifer and Ezekiel, he had an elevated mind. Thought he was somebody and a bag of chips. And God had to strike him. This is what happened with the king of Tyre. This is what's happening with the king of Egypt. El a point of view. This is why the scripture says that a serious tree was higher than the, than the other trees. And the scripture said what? That that tree would, no tree would ever be that tall again. And that's what the scripture says. So for Proverbs 16, 8 through 19 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor then to divide the spoil with the proud. We just great. Ain't got no business over there. No metal, yep. Yep, don't metal no the reason why is so just to catch Sister Alicia, in chapter 29, Egypt, the reason why Egypt is getting punished in this text is they were meddling in God, God's affairs. King, remember King Zedekiah? Okay, so he made a treaty. He was basically Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar put King Zedekiah on the throne. They had a treaty. Well, he got beside him beside his treaty and tried to make a treaty with and made a treaty with Egypt, the Pharaoh of Egypt. And Egypt made a treaty because he wanted to join forces with Egypt so they can both attack Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon and wipe them out. So he, so Nebuchadnezzar could be, I mean, so Zedekiah, come on now. So Zedekiah can be freed from the treaty. But what happened is, is that Egypt flipped on them. But God got mad at them because they meddled in God's affairs. The children of Israel are getting punished for sin. And we're doing wrongdoing. And so which led to what First Lady is saying about being in other people's affairs. Putting your nose in folk business that you ain't got no business put it into. There are some things that you just have to let go. Let go. Let go. Because it's not your affair. You don't know if God is punishing them or not. He doesn't have to reveal. To, he doesn't have to tell you. Ah, uh, here we go. He doesn't have to tell you if he's punishing somebody or not. We don't have to know what's going on in 20 locations. It's hard enough being saved my own self. Why well, I got to be in all these other folk affairs so I can just gossip? Because all I'm going to do is tell somebody what I found out. Ain't like I'm going to pray for them. Most of the time, folk just talking. Oh, you know what's going on down there. I ain't praying. Anyways, back to this because I don't want to go off on the tangent. But pride will lead you to the following. Arrogance. Proud, proud and unpleasant behavior towards other people based on a belief in one's own superiority or great importance. Pride will lead you to boasting. Negatively cons conceitedly praising oneself, positively trusting and, what'd you say? The, okay.
this is in the context of when you're exalting yourself as as being pride, but I'm glad you are acknowledging that. Somebody read it. But yes, this is when you're praising oneself. Okay, for instance. Yeah, there's another. Yes, yes. There's a positive and a negative. Was trusting in who God is and what he has done. That's the positive side. We're trusting in God. So we're boasting about what God has done, right? And who he is and we're trusting him. Negative is when you're trusting and when you're putting praise on oneself. So like, okay, go ahead. Yes, I. So in Ezekiel 28, the king of Tyre says, I am a God. It's in your Bible. He says, I am, in and you, and your Bible, sister, he says, I am a God, right? He is referring to himself. Nebuchadnezzar put himself as I. Remember the three Hebrew boys and all of them, right? That's me, me, I, I. Or, for instance, you just preached a good word, right? And instead of deferring the glory to God, you take it upon yourself. Now you are negatively boasting on yourself as if you were the one that preached. Even though God used your lips, it was God who was in you to speak the word to whoever you spoke to, right? That's why. You know, first lady, when it was teaching, she was teaching everybody praise dance and all that stuff. And they would say, you know, you guys were good to God be the glory. Right. I am automatically going to defer that to God because it wasn't me. It was God in me using me to speak to you. But it was his words. It was his words. So conceit, a state of pride arising out of a over. Yes, overestimation of one's own ability possession or importance <laughs> overestimating one's ability that's just crazy we got another one superiority a sense of being of great importance or value in comparison with others which can lead to arrogance and boasting you more important than everybody else that was fail but we can look at it today you just a bench warmer, but you just <laughs> because I'm at so and so church, uh, I'm more important. Oh, God is just in me. You ever seen folk that just the super holy, like just because they connected with so and so, they just I've, I've been, I just, I'm just, I'm deep, I'm deep with God, I'm with the bishop. You don't know. He was on the word network and God. <laughs> it's the same anointing that falls in Texas. But feeling that you're more important in comparison with others. You are doing yourself up. Or my favorite, um, pew pastors. Not pew pastors. Uh, what, what we call these seats? They're not the pew, but what we call them? Ah. Because you have the, yeah, they're pew, right? Because we got the pulpit and then, yeah, pew. Pew pastors. Uh, come see me in the parking lot, and I'm going to break down what Pastor was saying for you so that, you know, you can get a better understanding. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I got about 10 people that I'm over in the church. So I'm going to cause chaos because I'm going to bring about 10 folk under me, and then they're going to go through me to go talk to the pastor, or they're going to ex the pastor out and just begin to look at me. Because I have, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not at peace with myself. You know, I got a, I got a problem that I can't fix. And the only way I can fix is when folk are under me. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I'm going to leave that one alone. Right? Exaggeration. Pride will lead you to exaggerate. Now you're lying. Uh, uh, I'm bishop over uh, four churches. You got four names. You ain't even got a, you ain't got a, you ain't even in the hotel. You ain't even in the Holiday Inn. You know, you just thinking about four locations. You just got a P.O. box. Well, uh, well, really, I got four P.O. boxes. It's an overstatement of something usually related to its importance or value. Again, value. When you're, when you're caught up in pride, you have, a, you have a sense that you are not valued unless you are exalted in what you're doing. Unless you're exalted in what you're doing. Notice what this stems from, and I'm probably, we're going to stay home on here. But I want you to notice where root is really coming from. Oh, let me read this, and then I'll tell you this. Stubbornness. Now you're stubborn. A proud and disobedient, proud and disobedient resistance to God's will and rejection of his commands. I heard people say, Jesus got it wrong. You got famous people saying, well, you know, that was in Paul's day. We don't do that no more. Yeah, tell evangelists, yeah, just stubborn. Jeremiah 7, 4 says, but they do not obey or incline their ear, but walk in their own counsel and the stubbornness of their evil hearts and went back and not forward. You see, when you're lifted up in pride, you actually are going backwards. Because you're walking back to the beauty that caught you off guard. Notice, this all is going to tie back to that one word, beauty. When you just, ooh, my preaching is so good. So now I got to get people under me because my preaching is so good. I got to build a fellowship now. Just as an example. Right, and so now I want to build people. I want to. I want to. I don't want God to do this. Then I tie it and say, "What's well, the Lord's work? It ain't the Lord's work is your work." Then you ex- you got folk that ex- exaggerate. They lead to pride. They lead to in- lead to arrogance. You just arrogant. All just, just just and you just conceited and just crazy. And then you'll be like, "God is not telling me that." Somebody speak a real word. That wasn't for me. That was for you. You ever been in church with somebody and you know God is talking to them and they're going to push it off? Psh, that wasn't for me. You know it was for you. You know he was preaching about you. You want to, I checked myself. Or you just so, you just so stuck in yourself, you know you need prayer, but you don't want nobody else to see that you need prayer, so you're going to stay there and just rot. Because of your position. Your position has hold you captive of getting prayer. Mm-mm. Revelations. Revelation is God's act of revealing something to you humans. The necessity of revelations. Right, it tells us what it is impossible to gain adequate knowledge of God through human effort alone. God in mercy makes come on now, God in his mercy makes himself known through the incarnation of his son and the illumination of human minds to understand him. Incarnation, we know that that's God incarnated, God manifested in flesh. When you see a fancy word, is God manifesting in the flesh. Incarnation, fancy word, God manifesting in the flesh. But what? You cannot get a revelation through human effort. I'm going to repeat that. You cannot get a revelation through your own effort. It's got to come from God. Scripture says, We'll read John, but the text, the, the another topic says, God is beyond humans knowing. 
No, John 1 and 1 says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is the Father's side, he has made known to him. The human mind is limited. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? Remember, I told you, deep focus folk that don't study. Can you find out deep things of God? As soon as you get in there, you just like, man, I'm in a pool of water swimming, and, <laughs> and everything is good. I just want to stay right here. I'm, I, I am God. My feet still in the sand. I'm just putting my head in there. God, this is good. Let me understand this before I even get into the water. Right? Our mind is limited. Our mind is limited. Responses to revelations. God requires and imparts a frame of mind that receives and responds to what he has made known. People do not naturally understand what God has revealed. Can I repeat that again? You and I, keyword, naturally cannot understand the revelations of God. So when you have sinners who are trying to break down the word of God, they are using what? Their or what their own way, their own mind. They are naturally, because they have no spirit on the inside to interpret what God says. They have no spirit on the inside. So to the fail. They fail to recognize God's revelation in Jesus, Christ. And what does Christ represent? Thank you. It is not his last name. Jesus the Christ, the anointed one. Matthew tells us, at the time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and reveal them to the little children. What do we understand children really to be? Those that are servants. He has revealed those to those that are willing to serve. Not those who are wise, but those who want to actually serve God. Yes, Father, for such, a, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and to whom the Son has chooses to reveal. So it is the Sonship, it is the Anointed One, it is Jesus, the one that is able to reveal the revelation in this dispensation and you can't be wise you need to be a servant because a servant is willing to serve God he is willing to go if God says read the books you're willing to go read because you want to serve him my God you're not just saying my, you're not on your own kenosis you're not on your own knowledge you're on God's knowledge so revelations cannot be interpreted by natural understanding Revelations can only be interpreted, not just the book of Revelations, but Revelations being revealed to you can only be interpreted by God. God has to give you the insight. God is the one that gives you the key to unlock those good holy nuggets. My God. breaks that box, puts oil on his feet. Exactly. Exactly. She went into position to serve him. And she was at the low of the lowest. The woman would, would broke that oil. You was low. You was low when you was breaking that. You wasn't in no high, mighty position. Only the lowest of the lowest would go and wash folks' feet and break, clean people's feet. Took the hair, remember, and dried it off. It's low, the low. So they fail to understand God's revelations in general. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says, The natural person does not accept things of the Spirit of God, for they are 
something to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually, spiritually discerned. Ding dong, that's the nugget. They are spiritually discerned. They cannot be discerned naturally. The Bible says what? We wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. Our fight is not in the natural realm. It is in the supernatural realm. So the discern revelations that God gives you, you have to have a spiritual mind, not a natural mind. This is what this allegory, this prophecy lets us know also, that we have to look with the spirit mind when we're dissecting the text. That's why we all were able to say, you know what? This is about pride. This is about the downfall of pride. This is what happens when you pride is ruler over you. You become arrogant. In other words, you become a fool. You, be, you excommunicate yourself from folk. You just become a fool. You can't understand revelations because you're on yourself. That's why Nebuchadnezzar couldn't even interpret the dream that he had. Right? He was stuck on himself. And then he got just witches and magicians, and they couldn't interpret it because they're not spiritual. They're not, God, I'll put it this way, they're not godly spiritual. You got folk that are spiritual. I'm, brother, I was just with the stars. I was just with Buddha, Confucius, and, you know, we had a good meditation time. I, I got some of the, the, I was with yoga, and I was just yoga in, and I was getting all my little chi moments on. And so they get in tune with themselves. They get in tune with their body. That's not God. That's a false thing. There's no such thing as a Christian yoga. You are not supposed to get in tune with the creation. Oh, Lord, I'm going to sit down. Right. Who who is I so you want unless you, you want to use it. Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Okay. Good. Like they couldn't. They couldn't interpret it right because they 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 were in tune with Luke. And if God revealed something supernaturally, right? Let's put it in today's terms. Everybody knows about encryption, right? So if God gave you an encrypted message, you need a key to unlock that message. Certain revelations that God gives us are encrypted, right? And it says. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. He who has the key to unlock the encryptions, let, let it be revealed to you what God is saying. So you have these people like Nebuchadnezzar and the soothsayers who could not interpret that because they didn't have the right key to unlock it. Daniel, on the other hand, had the right key to unlock it because he had he was connected with God. If God is sending you a message to help interpret something. He's not going to send it to somebody that doesn't. They, they, in other words, they're not going to be able to pull this unless God chooses to reveal it to them. It's a choice. In this case, you know, instead of the witches. They were still acting under the unction of Satan. Now, right. But in this text, God uses Nebuchadnezzar 
as an agent or the sword to destroy that. And so if, if you remember earlier, remember Nebuchadnezzar had to, he had like a, 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 um, some animals that he did three sacrifices. And when he did these three sacrifices, these sacrifices were ritual to let him know who to go kill first. And the scripture said that God would allow these enemies to predict something so that they would come towards uh, Jerusalem. So in, in this case, I know what you're saying. God is in control of everything. So he can use an enemy for his purpose. But when in our t and what I'm saying is, is that when it comes to things of God and be revealing, no devil spirit can reveal that to you. That's got to come from God or somebody that serves God. Now, in the case of Egypt, when we had the 10 plagues, some of the musicians, the, magi the, magi the magicians were able to do some things. Remember, the stick turned the snake. They was able to turn snake right they were able to copy certain things so lucifer is able to copy certain things because remember he had some beauty and he had some authority but when it came to came to turn the night the night the, the night from day remember when the place came and israel had the light but on the other side of town it was right they couldn't change that which shows you that they have limited authority now remember joseph in jail he got a dream about the baker, right? And he little prophesy, right? And nobody else could interpret, again, Egypt, King Pharaoh. Nobody could interpret his dream but Joseph. He went to the mag uh, magicians and everything, but nobody could interpret it. So God will choose. God, God wants people that are serving him to, be re to have these revelations be revealed to him. But sometimes he'll use an enemy agent, amen, to get his point across, like Nebuchadnezzar, like in Isaiah, King Cyrus. King Cyrus was a pagan, did not serve God, but God used him to free the children of Israel. So it tells you that, number one, my point was in this text that God is sovereign and is in control of everything. He led Assyria rise in the leadership, but the reason is because Jerusalem got beside themselves. So they overpowered them. God, in other words, turned his back on them and let Assyria wipe Egypt, I mean, the children of Israel. Again, God turned his back, or not turned his back, but he divorced his church in, in Ezekiel. Remember when the glory left the temple? And it went all the way out to the east gate. And we understand the east gate now from when we went to Messiah's temple, right? So he left and went to the east gate where the light, where the glory will be shining and where you're supposed to come in with a praise in your heart. God left that same interest and then gave it over to Nebuchadnezzar to be an agent to kill. So what you have to understand is God can choose anybody that he wants to serve. Here's another example, last example. Balaam and Balak. You're, Balaam was a was a was a prophet, but he ended up getting killed because he was a soothsayer. He was a false prophet, but God used him to put a blessing on the children of Israel. He says, "I have a commandment to bless, and I cannot reverse it." God used him. God told him not to go, but he was disobedient. So God still used him but then he still got he still was he still died so it god can use us and just because he uses us doesn't mean that we're connected to him he just us your goal and my goal is to not just be used but i want to be connected with god because the bible says that many are going to say lord lord i cast out blah 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 in your name i did this in your name god use them for that person's benefit but they still didn't enter into the kingdom of god because their agenda was on them and not god or they didn't have a relationship with god so god can use a witch to get a point across, but he would prefer to use somebody that believes in him. It's his prerogative, it's his choice. But you and I, as saints of God, 
We need that encryption key to unlock God's nuggets. We need to be low like a child. We need to be a servant of God so we can unlock them nuggets so that it can help us to build our relationship and actually grow with God. I hope I didn't overkill your question. Hallelujah. That was it. Because y'all can, we just, this is just a breakdown of what we already read. But I want y'all to get to this text. I want y'all to get here to this slide, the nugget slide. Because it has some more um, imagery that is good to read at home. I just got some more reading material that I emailed to you guys about the splendor and the, the, the cedar and the splendor. Just a quick nugget and I'm done. Lebanon was known for its cedar. Matter of fact, they built some temples with Lebanon. They, they, they were known for good wood. And so sometimes God over-exaggerates to get a point across. What comes up, it's going to come down. If you build yourself up, he's going to bring you back down. And what's the what's the reason? So then, if we're saying the churches, then we're talking about a body of people. So then, you're saying that the body is going to fall. Which is not a good thing. It's a terrible thing. Not necessarily. The head can fall. Right. The head can fall, but also the body can fall. Right. And so, well, thank you. So, and yeah. Come on, grandma. If I wasn't sweating on this, I'd throw it at you. One third of the angels fell. And like she said, they were they were still coming to heaven. They were still in heaven. And they fell. Right. God It's a,
God hates that. Right. 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 And, you know, that's the five for me. He didn't say nothing about being a father after your after his own heart or anything like that. Not in the father. Now he gives a pastor after his own heart, but he will not give a father. A father a spiritual father is a father that's act, the person that is, and this is a Catholic tradition, right? Because they call them instead of they call them father. So in other words, they are the they are the go to person. They are the mediator between you and God. So when somebody is your father, your spiritual father, right? We're not talking about in a household, right, where a father is covering the children in a household. Yeah, they're supposed to be watching over, but a spiritual father or somebody you grown person, you got a quote unquote no that is somebody that you will go and keep in high regard and you will go to them before you'll go to God or they'll be the mediator between you and God. I'm trying to I'm trying to tell you. Right. <laughs> 